Hello, this is High Priestess Tehila from the Coven of the Open Mind, and this is Astrology 101, Lecture 2. For those of you who are following this series in real time, I apologize for the delay. <laughs> I haven't been feeling well lately. I've been procrastinating a lot. It's actually a good teaching moment because part of the reason is that there's a triple whammy in terms of retrogrades right now. I know I briefly mentioned them in the first lecture. I haven't really gone over it yet. I'm going to go over it when we talk about planets, but retrogrades essentially just amplify the energy of each planet. Right now we have Jupiter, Saturn, and Pluto all retrograde. Uh, Jupiter governs like expansion and often is related to spiritual pursuits. Pluto governs connection to the spirit collective unconscious, so that definitely governs spiritual pursuits, and Saturn is about time and order and management, time management, so right now it just is really hard to want to spend time doing spiritual things, um, being, you know, caring about spiritual growth. Uh, I'm very sensitive to the planets, it's something that's always been the case for me, so um, has me a bit exhausted. And Mars goes retrograde. Mars goes retrograde this week. So that's going to be even worse for productivity. So mentally prepare yourselves for that. <laughs> but thankfully, it's only a two-week overlap before Jupiter is no longer retrograde. And I think Saturn stops in August and Pluto in October. So we're definitely over the hump, <laughs> coming down, getting back into the swing of things. I did create this and the next presentation. So I'm hoping to get these two out kind of close together and uh, get them up on the website and get things going again. I also plan to come back to some of the other series. I, I do have plans in the works. It's just, like I said, been really hard to want to do anything besides watch TV and play games on my phones and you know, that sort of thing. But anyway, here we are. So this is Astrology 101, Lecture 2. This time we're going to talk about the Zodiac. We're going to cover the first six signs. Uh, and I will assign homework like I always do if you're interested in doing further reading or getting some different perspectives. Uh, and then we'll do the next six signs in the next presentation. Go to the next slide. Why is it not working? There we go. So to start off, I thought it might be nice to do a guided meditation. People had said they really like the guided meditation from, um, from the Wicca and Witchcraft 101 series, so I decided to do something like that here. When I first learned astrology, I learned with um, one of the sacred, one of the um, covens of the Assembly of the Sacred Wheel, and we did a guided meditation just like this, a, li a little similar, but this is my own take on it. So I hope you guys enjoy it. What I want you to do is just sit and, and relax, get into a comfortable position. The guided meditation should just take a few minutes. It's not long or anything. I just want you to kind of close your eyes or keep them open if that's how you focus best. Just let your gaze unfocus in that case. Um, take some deep breaths, get into a nice state of mind. And then I'm going to describe the zodiac kind of as a journey from childhood through adulthood. And I have on the slide the key points that we're going to hit at each stage. And then as we talk about each of the signs, uh, we'll talk about how some of these things uh, apply and manifest in, in more specific details. So go ahead and get comfortable. Take some deep breaths. Breathe in and out. Breathe in and out. Breathe in. And out. Breathe in. And out. Imagine a small child. He starts with a ton of energy, but no purpose. As all childs do, children do, he runs around, he has lots of emotion, has no direction. Creativity is key at this phase as he begins experimenting with the world, experimenting with himself, mastering first language, then understanding of how he fits into the greater picture. He 
he ages through this point where everything is uncertain, everything is fresh, everything is being created, being understood, slowly into a stage of puberty, the first stage of stability in his life. And it's in this stage where he begins to define himself and his energy. Here he is still ruled by his emotions and he is very stubborn to outside influence. He doesn't want to hear that he's too young to understand. Imagine back to when you were a teenager and the adults in your life told you that you just can't get it and it's frustrating and, and you want to feel that you are just as mature as, as you perceive yourself to be in the minds of others. From this stage, he emerges as the young sage. Here, he just enters into, into teenagehood, into the early stages of teenagehood. It's here where he starts to think philosophically, come to some conclusions about the world around him, about the people around him. And their immature philosophies, their ideas, just vague thoughts, little tidbits that the seeds of which will grow and blossom into huge trees of knowledge and understanding and wisdom in time. But for now, they're just getting started, the vague thoughts and ramblings of a teenager. And as he ages through this stage into the early stages of teenagehood, he slowly starts to realize the importance of family, seeing friends as family, feeling hurt uh, like he never did before, feeling love, uh, anger, pain, joy, as he never did before. And he realizes there's nothing more important than this feeling. There's nothing more important than finding and feeling love and finding a way to belong. He approaches into early adulthood, becoming more and more mature. Slowly, he's able to express himself better. He's able to provide direction to his creative pursuits. Now he is the center of attention. He just graduated from high school. He's on top of the world. He's at the peak of his physical and mental ability, or getting close to it, or so he thinks. <laughs> he feels like the most important in the world, center stage, the kind of per person that everyone wants to applaud. And this momentum takes him forward into college. In this stage, he's really truly starting to mature. He's finding a stability. Uh, he's finding a stability in instability. He's realizing that that sense of importance doesn't help him succeed in life. The realities of life extend far beyond anything he could have imagined as a child. And so his philosophies grow, the tree, the, the seeds grow into small trees, and he moves forward in life, studious, ready to conquer the world, to, to conquer all of the challenges put before him, but not quite emotionally and, and spiritually mature enough to see the greater picture. And so there's judgment, there is worry, there is fear of what others will think of him. And from this reality check, he finds harmony in himself. He finds the means to survive as an adult, to thrive as an adult. And the focus of his life shifts from who he was, who others see him to be, to who he wants to be. 
his insecurities fade away, fear of the opinion of others dissipates, and he is transformed into a more empowered being. Now, once his persona is fully developed and established, now he seeks out other like-minded individuals. He finally has a good sense of his philosophies and his values. He's very optimistic that others will share those values if only he can express himself well enough to find them. He is fully capable of self-expression. He finds it easy to seek out his kind. And once he finds those he will spend his life with, then he reaches the last stage of stability in his lifetime. His career goals are manifest. His home life is manifest and everything is achieved. He's found the people he shares philosophies and values with, they've gotten along, they've built a life together, and his goals are manifest. Now what? He could be taken by depression or feel motivation to extend his success to the world at large. And so his focus necessarily shifts on what, from what he had been doing, his own work, to what he will leave behind. Is there enough left to help his family thrive? Is there anything left to continue his work when he is gone? Anyone left? These questions plague on his mind and he wants to find the answer. Perhaps he starts by donating here or there, becoming more involved in the community, but that's not enough. It's not enough to just give on an individual level. He wants to donate the money to have a whole school be built or discuss how a soup kitchen should be run. Perhaps in his youth, he would have gone and filled bowls of soup for the homeless and the hungry. But now, now he's ready to think about whether or not that approach is even effective. Perhaps he writes a book. In any case, once this feeling is exhausted, once he is content to pass on, whether he is remembered or not, then he can rest. He retires, seeking spiritual advancement, and retreats to spend the remainder of his days with his thoughts. He walks open-heartedly, hand-in-hand with death, at peace with his life, preparing for the great transformative journey to die and be reborn into the fire and passion of youth in his next life. Take a few more deep breaths. Slowly open your eyes, bring your gaze back to focus, and we're done. And that's just a brief walk through the zodiac as a being. You may recognize some of those signs, you may recognize some of those themes. The idea here is to capture what it means, each and every one of these signs, to capture what they mean. Uh, in an analogy that helps express the, the very core essence of each sign. So now we'll shift focus a little bit. We'll pull from Virgo a little bit. We'll talk about Virgo today. We'll become more studious and we'll talk a bit more in depth about each of these signs. To start with, I want to talk a bit about how to learn the signs. When you're first coming into astrology, it can be really overwhelming. For people who have a scientific background, like I do, it's a little bit easier 
you're already trained to think a little more scientifically, so, well, probably a lot more scientifically than most, to understand uh, that astrology is both a science and an art. Uh, for people who are coming into this fresh and who have very little exposure to that way of thinking, it can be a little overwhelming. So my recommendations are to first take the time to learn the symbols. Each of these signs has a symbol associated with them. They have planets associated with them. They have parts of the body associated with them. So the first thing that you should do is take the time to understand which sign is which and where it goes in the zodiacal wheel. And I'll show you a picture in a second of the zodiacal wheel. So you can also refer to the flat wheel from the first lecture, or I'll also include the flat wheel in this one because it's relevant to the homework. Then you should write down the keywords for each sign in your book of shadows or your magical journal. So I literally in my book of shadows, I've shown this to you guys before I think, um, I have a page here with the flat wheel and the associations. I have the signs and symbols. I have a bit about what each sign and everything does. Uh, and then on this I go into the details of each sign. So I have the keywords and the dates of the solar month and all that good stuff. I recommend just writing all of that down. Get it down in your book. And then on this page I have the planets and the houses, right? Write it all down. Get it in your book. Eventually you'll memorize it. You'll barely look at it. But it's worth it to have those keywords because the easiest way to interpret a chart is to start off by doing the actual chart itself, filling in where everything goes, and then writing down the keywords that are critical for that person based on which signs and planets are prominently placed in the chart, and then looking at all those together and interpreting it in a way that's very similar to scrying or you know seeing images in tea leaves, that sort of thing, where you kind of just look at it from afar and wait until you see the patterns and then you can stitch it all together. It's really hard to read a chart or, or make a prediction for someone based on just one or two or even their top three signs. So even if you're doing rising sun, moon, and solar house, even if you do the main four, it's still really hard to get an accurate chart reading because the planets will affect how those things manifest. So that's why it's easiest just to write it all down, all the keywords you can possibly think might be relevant, and then stitch it all together. Uh, consider what the signs mean to you. That's very important. This is not a science. It's based on science, as we discussed in the first lecture, but it's not a science. It's an art. You have to interpret what, what the chart means. You know, copying everything down to the chart, that's science. We're going to use an astronomy tool. It's a tool they use to line up telescopes, so it's very accurate. You write everything down. The science is done. You put science aside. You do what we just did. Unfocus your gaze. Relax. Put yourself in a state of mind where you can experience experience what the chart is trying to tell you. Experience it. It's almost like a form of empathy. The signs can have slightly different meanings uh, depending on where they are in the chart. Uh, when we say that a sign is prominent, we mean that it's placed in somewhere important. So the sun is in it. That means it's prominent. Or um, so the rising sign is prominent. Or uh, if someone has like seven planets in one sign, that sign is probably really prominent in their chart, right? So that sort of thing. Um, so just keep in mind that interpretation is an art, kind of like divination. It's something that you have to work on and practice and get better at over time. Now, the zodiacal wheel looks like this. These are the symbols. Uh, so looking at this, it's going to seem overwhelming if you've never seen these symbols before and you're like, oh, holy goodness, it's like a foreign language. It is. A lot of people say it's a lot like a foreign language. So what you've got to do is just learn the symbols for the planets, for the stars, or for the star signs, I should say. You know, learn all the symbols and then the rest will come easy. Okay, the first symbol on the wheel is Aries. The associations, Aries associates with the ram. The symbol is in the top right corner here. That's its actual astro astrological symbol. And the ram is 
pictured here on the slide. Some also call it the warrior. Uh, so it's, it's a battle sign. It's a fire sign. And it's cardinal fire. So remember how we spoke about the concept of there being fi cardinal fixed and mutable components of each element. It basically breaks down into 12. You, know, you have four elements, and each one contains a little of each of the other elements. So four times three modes is 12. That's where it comes from. So you have a little of each, a little of each element in the rest of them. And what does that mean? Well, that means a whole heck of a lot. And it can really help you understand what each sign actually should be interpreted to mean. In this case, Aries is in the quadrant of Earth. It's in the season, quote unquote, of Earth. And that means, and, and that's because the fixed sign in that quadrant is Taurus, which comes next. The fixed signs are the ones at the four, the four corners. They align with the fixed Wiccan holidays. So you have May Day, Beltane, Luknasa in August, August 1st. Then you have uh, Samhain, and finally um, Imyolk in that's not really the right order in terms of the start and end of the year for Wiccans, but that is the start and the end of the Zodiac. Now those fixed signs, which occur on the same day every year, um, they embody what that quadrant represents. So in the first quadrant, you have Earth. The second is fire. The third is water. And the fourth is air. If you're watching the Wicca and Witchcraft 101 videos, you'll notice that these go up the pentagram, right? So you have the two Earth-based signs at the bottom and the two signs that are the two Earth-based elements, sorry, at the bottom and the two elements of the part of us that is higher reasoning, the part of us that is spiritual, the part of us that is in our minds are the, the second two elements. So it goes in exactly the order you'd expect in terms of becoming more and more mature, just in line with the, the story that I gave at the beginning. So you have the least mature being Aries and the most mature being Pisces. And as you go around the circle, you get less selfish and more selfless. Not to say that any one is better than the other. Ideally, we would all be a very healthy balance of selfish and selfless. We have compassion for ourselves, we take care of ourselves first, so that we have the ability to give back and care for others. Ideally, a lot of people have a lot of planets and signs and, and prominent placements in the lower bowl, as it's called, in, in the lower hemisphere, which, if you remember from the first lecture, represents the self. People who have signs in there tend to be a little more selfish or self-absorbed. And then in the higher side of things, in the upper bowl, in the upper half of the upper hemisphere, whatever you want to call it, you have the um, signs that are more about giving to other people and being selfless and thinking about other people, etc. So let's go back to the conversation of cardinal fixed immutable. Within the Earth quadrant, you have Aries, which is cardinal fire. It is the fire of earth. Taurus is the earth of earth. And Gemini is the air of earth. So what does that really mean? Well, that really means Aries is like a volcano. It's like lava. It's like the pressure that builds up before it explodes out everywhere and becomes land. Land, physical earth, rocks, that's the earth of earth. Then you have Gemini. Gemini is the air of earth. So that would be like, you know, the dust that gets blown up into the sky when a volcano erupts, to stick with the analogy. Or you could think about it as the dust that gets blown up into a tornado, if you will. Uh, and we'll talk about what each of those things mean as we talk about those signs. For Aries, oops, I accidentally opened a calculator. Don't do that. 
two calculators. <laughs> For Aries, the solar month dates are from the 21st of March through the 20th of April. So notice the 21st of March corresponds, usually it, it changes a little bit, 20th, 21st, corresponds with the start of, with, with a star, with the start of the season of Earth. That's why it's called that, because it's ruled by, that quadrant is ruled by Earth, by Taurus. So this aligns with the head and body. I know that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Because we're saying, oh, it's the least mature, it's, well, it shouldn't be the feet or something. No, because if you think about it this way, Pisces is the feet and it goes around this way. So the reason why humans are so immature and flighty and emotional and irrational and do all kinds of crazy things is because the head and the body was created last, was focused on last, so it's the least mature. And that's the idea. So you have the astrology goes around this way, but then the age, or, or if you think about it like a body, it goes around the other way. It gets very confusing with things going all over the place. <laughs> but just know that it aligns with the head and body, mostly the head. Its ruling planet is Mars. So there you go. It's the battle planet, battle planet. But it's also the planet of getting things done, productivity, pioneering, inventiveness, uh, quick wittedness, uh, being dynamic, being inventive but so also being selfish, being quick-tempered, impulsive, being impatient, all that good stuff. The people who have this prominently in their chart often are faced with the challenge of growth and learning. It can be very hard for them to want to stick with something long enough that it makes a lasting impact. They always want to be doing something new. And they can be, you know, sometimes passive-aggressive, doesn't always overtly translate to someone who like beats their wife, okay? <laughs> Oftentimes, Aries are the ones who are doing that kind of abusive stuff, but not always, okay? It really is not always. You have to keep in mind the energy of a child. You know, children sometimes can be violent, but oftentimes they're wonderful and they're very peaceful and they're just, they have a lot of energy and they run around and do a lot of crazy things. <laughs> and, and that's what you have to bear in mind is that a lot of people think Aries, the ram, and they think butting heads and that is one aspect of the sign, but it's not the only aspect. Um, so this represents aggressiveness in the simplest sense. Uh, think about a child who says, I have to go to the bathroom, I have to go to the bathroom, and then you ignore the child for whatever reason because you can't get the child to the bathroom, and then the child just pees on the floor in himself, and instead of saying, oh, I'm sorry, uh, I didn't mean to, or anything similar, he just says, well, I told you I had to go to the bathroom. So that represents, that represents, you know, the sign pretty much perfectly. Sometimes it's kind of that passive aggression as opposed to just overt aggression. Um, but it's always aggression, that's for sure. <laughs> um, it represents the head, and that's why it's the simplest and most, most useful youthful sign. It's had the uh, lowest amount of time to develop, as we said. Okay, so Taurus. Taurus is the earth of earth. It is stubborn and strong, yet it can be worn away slowly over time. So it's patient. Uh, it, it associates with the bull or the earth spirit. The solar month is from the 21st of April to the 21st of May. It aligns with the throat. And its ruling planet is Venus, so it's ruled by love. Um, and and in and in many um, in many archetypes, it's seen as the winged bull. So the four um, the four key creatures are often seen to have wings because they are the transcendent ones that rule their houses. Yada yada. So um, so Tarses are patient, reliable, warm-hearted protective, right? So they, they have that nurturing, creative energy. They're, they're like the kind of energy that gives homes to people. Uh, think of like caves, right? Shelter. That, that's the kind of energy that you're thinking of with Taurus. They're very predictable and secure, uh, and, and they love natural things and being a part of nature. However, they're still in the first quadrant, so they're still also immature. And that means that you run into things like too much protectiveness, that it manifests in things like jealousy or possessiveness. Um, you're thinking, you know, um, you know, too much inflexibility, too much stubbornness to the point where they don't want to change. They can be self-indulgent. 
Um, they can have issues changing their bad habits and making good habits. Um, they're greedy, not in the sense that they want to just gather up everything around them for the sake of it, but because they take stability for material things. So I had a friend growing up who was a Taurus, and she just like had all these blankets and things that she really liked that she would not get rid of, even though they were falling apart and they were disgusting. And I offered to buy her new things, and she didn't even want them. Like it wasn't the money; it and it was just that these were her things. <laughs> Why would I get rid of my things? You know that kind of um, that kind of attitude. And the predictable nature of a Taurus can be both a pro and a con. So these ones often struggle to um, overcome the challenge of practicality and productivity. Uh, many times their attitude is what you see is what you get and they're very firm in that what you see is what you get. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> so they're nurturing um, through they're very protective as I said uh, and it's more like hoarding over greed. Um, these are the folks who work really hard uh, the kinds of people who walked uphill both ways to work on their feet all day to provide for their family, that kind of people. Um, less willing to go out and find new job opportunities so that they don't have to work hard and more likely to just continue working hard because that's what they've always done. The last one in this quadrant is Gemini. Gemini aligns with the twins or the witness. Its solar month is the 22nd of May through the 21st of June. So again, note the 21st of June, that's another holiday, right? That's Litha, and that's the start of the season of fire. The next quadrant is ruled by fire. So we just entered the season of fire, which is my personal favorite. <laughs> so I hope you like it too. We'll talk about that one next. For now, let's talk about Gemini. So Gemini aligns with the shoulders, hands, arms, lungs, and nervous system. So we're getting a little slower down, like a little lower down the body. The ruling planet is Mercury. So it's, think, communication, uh, interaction. Um, they're, most people who have prominent Geminis are very extroverted. Uh, they always want to be talking to people, paying attention, you know, seeing people. But, you know, they turn on a dime. So, um, you know, so some of the key words that are adaptable, versatile, communicative, witty, intellectual, uh, flirty. You know, that's something you should bring in. But also flighty. They bring everything in. They take everything in, no matter what it is. And, and it, often it doesn't even hurt them, even if it's bad, because they just take everything in. Um, some of the cons, they're nervous and tense. They tend to be superficial, um, caring more about sometimes things that are less important in the long run. It's not necessarily superficial as in like how it's used to mean that they care about physical appearance, but specifically caring about things that won't matter in the long run. How they feel right now often matters more than how they will feel later. They tend to be inconsistent, too inquisitive. They might ask you know, questions that would make some people uncomfortable. Uh, they're hard to follow. I know it's weird because it's ruled by Mercury, so you'd think, oh, they're really good at communicating. It's, mm, they like communicating, and they can be very charming, but sometimes they just like skip steps in their reasoning, and suddenly you're like, what? <laughs> How did you get to that conclusion? Um, they can also be overly observant, so Gemini sometimes are the chatty um, kinds of uh, gossipers. Um, and, and their challenge is, is curiosity. Too much curiosity, not enough curiosity, they fluctuate a lot between having too much and, and too little. So they turn on a dime, they assimilate information very quickly. Even when they're not necessarily able to comprehend it, they'll still just remember it anyway. <laughs> Um, often Geminis are quick to misinterpret things, again, because they think faster than they should. They jump to conclusions, they skip steps, that kind of thing. So even when they haven't gotten to the bottom of something, they might think that they have. Um, they're unpredictable, they're tough to read because they're always changing. Like, think like, again, like a tornado, like, like, like earth become wind, you know, that's what this is, the, the wind of earth. Um, they will reinterpret everything that comes in and then spit it out so that it's almost unrecognizable from the original source. Um, how did you get there and what the heck are you talking about are things that people will often ask Geminis. <laughs> um, they're very observant, um, but they don't act like they know, they act, they act like they don't know what's going on. So until later, until much later. So uh, they'll eventually bring that up and it'll be like, 
what? You remembered that? Why do you even care about that? <laughs> um, so that's where the two-faced nature comes from. It's not that they necessarily are manipulative or two-faced on purpose. They just act in a way which is very hard to understand from the outside, very dynamic type of people. So the next one is Cancer. We're entering the season of fire, the quadrant of fire, quadrant number two. In this one, you have Leo is the fixed sign, and that have, that represents Lutnasa, the hottest time of the year, right? So that's August, and it associates with, um, you know, so so think of Cancer. Cancer is the water of fire. It's cardinal water. Uh, so it's very young, but still extremely emotional. Okay, so like your late teenage years where everything is so important. And if you don't wear exactly the right prom dress and go with exactly the right date, your life might literally end. And if a friendship ends, it's the end of the world. That's cancer. That's the energy of cancer. It associates with the crab or the invisible man. The solar month is from June 22nd to, to July 22nd. And it aligns with the breasts and the stomach. The ruling planet is the moon. Makes sense. Very emotional, very watery. So some of the keywords here, we're, we're talking about healing energy, emotional, loving. Think, what is the what is the fire of water? I don't I can't always come up with analogies for these things, but think about what fire and water do, right? Fire gives life and water heals. So this is the kind of energy that not only heals, but heals in a way that also gives you vitality and strength. Very supportive loving, caring people. They're very intuitive and protective. Uh, they tend to be imaginative, but they're also sometimes cautious as well because they know that they're very emotional and, and they don't want to over give, uh, to give too much of themselves and they're, and they're more able to keep track of that than say another watery sign like, like Pisces, which we'll talk about next time. Um, some of the cons, they are very changeable again. They're often moody, right? Because now you have the emotions to so think like the, you know, the emo stage that a lot of teenagers go through, uh, over emotional, they tend to be very touchy and clingy. So you can easily offend them and they don't let things go very easily. Um, their challenge to overcome is creating safe spaces and inspiring growth. Um, you know, think of like shallow water, the very first drops of water that sustain you in the heat of the day. Because this is, you know, the second quadrant aligns with noon. Uh, they have, you know, that life-giving, straightforward, and comforting aspects of water because it's cardinal energy. Um, they turn cold though, and they shut down the minute that they are cut down. So you say something to a, a cancer, and they just shut down. And they never apologize, not because they don't care what they did to you, or because they think, not because they don't agree that they did something wrong, but because it hurts them when they hurt you. It hurts them so badly that they don't want to face it. Uh, and I guess you know, embarrassment might be a good way to think about that. Uh, they get embarrassed by their you know, what they have done to hurt people. So then they shut down and they don't want to talk about it anymore. So these are the kinds of people that get upset when they upset you. And you're like, why are you upset? I'm the one who should be upset. <laughs> so that's this kind of energy. Uh, just like the moon, they have many phases, moody, manic, etc. And again, they shut down when they're insulted um, at just as quickly as when they insult another. There's no way to know exactly how they're going to react to an emotion. There's just no way to predict it um, because they're so, you know, that's how water is. It's very hard to predict how it's going to react. And so if they feel secure, uh, they if they feel secure, then you'll feel, feel secure. It's not enough if you think they're secure. You have to make sure they actually feel secure. And when that happens, then you bring out the more positive side of things and some of the less you know, positive side of things drop away. So if you have a child who is a cancer and they're going through their teenage years, really keep that in mind. <laughs> it doesn't matter how many times you reassure them, it's never gonna be enough times. <laughs> they have to believe it or it's just not true. <laughs> That's all there is to it. So now we'll move into Leo, the winged lion. This is the fire of fire, okay? Fixed fire, He's, it associates with the lion or the child. 
Um, the solar month is the 23rd of July through the 22nd of August. Uh, it aligns with the heart and spine, and the ruling planet is the sun. So very obvious what kind of energy this is going to be, but it's self-expressive, creative, generous, warm-hearted, giving, leadership ability, open-mindedness, faithfulness, love, enthusiasm, all of the elements that we also associate with uh, with the sun. They can be pompous and patronizing though, coming off as bossy or interfering. That's me. <laughs> I do that a lot. I'm half Leo, half Virgo sun sign. So I tend to often either come off as overcritical or bossy. <laughs> Something that I've been working on for a very long time. Um, their challenge is to shine positively. Uh, these are the people that can't stay out of the spotlight even if they try. So they're always shining. It's just a matter of whether or not they're shining so brightly they burn you or shining just enough that they give you life and, and help nourish you without actually hurting you in any way. So once they reach that balance, then they can excel at leading others. And, and Leo is really the sign of leadership. Uh, they're savage but righteous with lots of willpower. Uh, they're brash, bold, out there and in your face, extroverts, okay, people who are not scared to do things like get online and give lectures to people in front of whoever knows who's going to see it. <laughs> um, they're the types of people who are not great at doing illegal things like, you know, like um, embezzlement or something because they do not slip under the radar at all. <laughs> they draw so much attention to themselves. They always get in trouble if they do something wrong, so they tend to be very uh, straight edge. They can get burnt out and exhausted uh, if you know, from all the attention, especially if it's unwanted attention that happens pretty often for them. Uh, and then they'll shut down and they can become doubtful, judgmental, uh, full of like self-loathing, kind of that, um, that sensation of wanting to uh, crawl back, you know, crawl back under a rock and say, don't look at me, don't look at me, I did something wrong, don't look at me, <laughs> don't even look at me, I don't even want you to touch me, I don't even want you to look at me, I'm just going to go you know, sleep this off. Um, they crave feedback. Uh, they like to have an audience, if you will, um, to, to make them feel comfortable in their own skin. So it's not really, um, it's not really a vanity thing. It's more just like they're very extroverted and they need that energy coming in to know that they're doing the right thing and, and representing themselves well, you know, that sort of thing. Lastly, in this quadrant, we have Virgo. So Virgo is the earth of fire. And and that is that means it's like it's like the dying embers of a fire that, that's recently been, been put out. It aligns with the virgin or the servant. Uh, it's from the 23rd of August to the 22nd of September. Look again, 22nd of September. What, what is that? That is the day when you switch from the season of fire to the season of water. You go from um, from Wagnasa into Mebon. This sign aligns, aligns with the GI tract. Its ruling planet is also Mercury. So you have two planets that double up. Mercury is one of them. It's, we all know Virgos. I mean, it's because if you're a Virgo, you're like, I'm sorry, I'm a Virgo. <laughs> That's like every Virgo has said that at some point in time, <laughs> um, myself included. I say it. I say it all the time. I'm like, my Virgo is coming out. <laughs> um, so they're they're mod they're often modest and shy. They're not very vain. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that they can't express themselves, though, right? So they're great at communicating uh, as long as it's in like an analytical sort of way, and they're communicating usually about um, usually about intellectual subjects and philosophy, right? So that's where you get that college. If you think back to the guided meditation, Virgo is like that college stage. They're very uh, diligent and reliable and analytical and organized. And, you know, everyone knows what Virgo is like because everyone knows a Virgo that they just can't stand to be around because they're always trying to plan everything and figure everything out and, you know, find the best way of doing it and then execute their plans. They're always making to-do lists and that sort of thing, making lists. And, and so we all know Virgos can be perfectionists, they can be worrisome and fussy and overcritical and harsh and conservative. And I should have probably put a keyword on here I did not include. I should have put judgmental. Uh, this is not something that often comes up 
for people. Um, I didn't learn that word in my classes when I took classes on astrology, um, but I have found that many people who are Virgos tend to be a little bit judgmental of other people. It's that overcritical nature. Sometimes that judgmental and overcritical nature turns inward on themselves. It really depends on where things are in the chart. Um, so for me, it definitely is more, you know, I'm my own worst critic. Um, so it just depends on where it is in the chart. The challenge of Virgos is becoming unbiased, learning to see the world through a lens that is separate from their own experiences. Um, they like to create order out of everything. They're always checking things many, many times to be sure they're done right. I'm only half Virgo, by the way, so I don't, I do like half of these things. <laughs> um, they impact on other people uh, does not come from, the, their impact on other people does not come from judgments on others or on criticality, even though those thoughts are often there, um, but rather they consider one's ability to make those types of changes for themselves first. So while they do tend to be judgmental and overcritical, often times it's because they are that good, right? They're the kind of person who is walking the walk. They demonstrate that they clearly understand how to better themselves and how to do this, that, or the other thing. Um, and so why can't you do it? If I can do it, you can do it. That's something a Virgo might often say. Um, they see both sides of the coin. Uh, so they are sure to only call what needs to be called so they don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. So they're very good at saying, okay, this is a positive trait, this is a negative one, this is positive, this is negative, this is what I need to do to get to this stage, this is what I need to do to get to this stage, and then they execute on it very well. Um, so they may not always be that unbiased, but oftentimes that unbias only comes into place when they're looking at themselves in the mirror. Sometimes it's when they're looking externally. Again, it just depends on where these things are located in the chart, really. So, Okay, so that's our first lecture for the Zodiac. Um, the homework for this is to copy the flat wheel into your book of shadows. I put it on the next slide so that you don't have to flip back to the previous lecture if you don't want to. Um, as I said, we're reading from the Astrology Book by James R. Lewis. You should be able to find a free copy of that online. I will put a link to a PDF in the uh, homework documents that go on the website uh, if I determine that I'm safe to do that because of copyright laws. Um, I'm always a little worried about copyright laws. I don't really know what is and isn't okay. I mean, I'm not doing this for profit, but I don't know. I don't know what the rules are. Um, if anyone knows what the rules are, please feel free to comment because I would like clarification. But um, I'll try to get that PDF to you guys. You don't have to buy it. Um, but the astrology book is basically, we read the introduction last time and parts of it were like, it's like super wordy and stuff. Parts of this one are also really wordy, so feel free to skim it. But it does provide a bit of a, a fuller perspective and some additional details and some things that are a little different than what I said. Uh, again, astrology is an art, so there's a lot of different ways of looking at it. So it's important to get different perspectives and to not just take everything I say as gospel because I do make mistakes. Um, you know, that's... That's a real thing. <laughs> so um, I'd say to read these sections this week on air signs, Aries, cardinal signs, Taurus, earth signs, fixed signs, Gemini, Cancer, Leo, Virgo. So then you'll have a much better idea of what the cardinal and fixed energy is like. Next time we'll talk more about mutable energy because it just aligns a bit better with the other, um, the second hemisphere. So, um, but this one will also help you understand a bit about air signs and earth signs. Um, it'll help you get a better perspective about the different signs. And I put the page numbers in the book here as well. They're not in order. Sorry, they're in alphabetical order, I think. No, they're not in any order. They're not in any order at all. Sorry. <laughs> See, I'm only half Virgo. <laughs> um, so there you go. So that's the homework. Of if you guys want to copy the charts on, on the index page into your magical journal as well, I highly recommend that. Uh, that has the symbols and associations and stuff as well. So that's exactly what you need to copy down that you can reference later. And then you just read these things, copy down the keywords, get your own understanding of what they mean, and then we'll work later on on some example star charts. 
And then here is the flat wheel again. So if you want to look at this, notice the first quadrant here with Aries, Taurus, and Gemini, where Taurus is the fixed sign. In the next one, you have Cancer, Leo, Virgo, where Leo is the fixed sign. And note that Mercury appears twice in this lower quadrant. And Venus, the second planet that appears twice, the next place it appears is Libra. So it's right away. So the lower resonance planets are in the bottom quadrant, which makes sense because they're less mature. The higher resonance planets are found in the second quadrant, which makes sense because they're more advanced energy, energy that we discovered later, that impacted us later. Some of these actually used to have different signs ruling them before we discovered Pluto. Scorpio was ruled by Mars, for instance, um, but it makes a lot more sense for Scorpio to be ruled by Pluto. We'll talk about that next time. If you guys have any questions, feel free to put a comment. Um, I, I wouldn't try too hard to get started actually doing your chart yet. Uh, once we get through the zodiac, once we talk about the planets, uh, then you'll be in a pretty good shape to start looking at your chart, and we'll start actually copying your information down into the chart next time. Okay, so if you have any questions, let me know, and otherwise, from everyone here in the Covenant of the Open Mind, blessed be.